Hi there, how are you doing today? My name is Kyle Sword. I'm the manager of business development for NSG Pilkington. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about glass and window basics. So this is an AIA HSW accredited course. I spent a lot of time talking about this with architects and at different conferences and within our group. But the reason I like this course is it's it's kind of fun. It goes through the history of glass manufacturing, window design, window manufacturing, talks about the last couple hundred years about how this has been done. And then it segues into an existing building, some of the potential treatment options that you have. And one of the ways that we use some products called vacuum insulated glazing and some other kind of newer emerging technologies to deal with historic restoration. So thanks again for your time. As I mentioned, this is an HSW accredited course. Um, if this is part of a program that we've uh, pre-registered you and set you up, it'll be pretty straightforward to get your credits. If this is something that you're watching on demand, um, if you just follow through the scripts afterwards, if there is a quiz, just fill in the quiz and submit it and it'll be pretty straightforward. If it's something that you've just come across online and you're still interested in credits, my email message address is at the end. Um, send me a message and we can uh, we can talk through that and then I can set up a potential uh, uh, Q&A session afterwards. But the whole point of this program is to try and talk about some of the history of glass and window manufacturing. You know, how has that evolved over the last couple hundred years? How has that uh, impacted how you design windows? And then what are some of those treatments and how does vacuum insulated glazing kind of play into this? So to do this well, I actually talk through a couple different things. I talk about how glass has been made. I talk about how coatings have been made and then how window and IGU or insulated glazing products have changed. I talk about performance because what we're trying to do is accomplish certain sort, sorts of performance that you would typically get on a replacement window. I talk a little bit about vacuum insulated glazing or VIG, and then I go through some case studies and talk about different alternatives that we might face. So again, the very first re thing I'm gonna start talking about is glass and coatings, and I'll go through some of this history, but one of the reasons that I do that, and, and I don't think people maybe appreciate how complicated glass has got, is this is on the left-hand side. This dates back to the 1970s, 1980s in North America. So what you're seeing here is, you know, we used to be a company called Libby Owens Ford or LOF. And back in the 1970s, we were really one of, I mean, two companies that sold glass and were primary glass manufacturers. So we take the raw materials, we melt them in a big furnace, and then we make big sheets of glass. I mean, there were a couple other emerging companies, but really there were two main companies. And this is what our sampling looked like. On the left, that's our catalog. So everything that we made could fit on one page. And on the middle here, these are our sample boxes. So we had essentially four different colors, three or four different thicknesses. And what you would do if you were gonna make a window is you would pick one of those 12 or 13 things, you'd cut it into a rectangle and you'd put it in a frame. And our products were basically the same as what our competitors were. So they're really, if you're gonna make windows and buildings, there wasn't a lot of complexity in what you chose. And compare that to today, this is on the right, this is one of our customers. They have a two page catalog and all this is is double glazed products. So this is two pieces of glass sandwiched together in an insulated unit. And the variance that they have of just that one option alone, there's two pages of them because now there's about a dozen different people that manufacture glass. There's more people that make coatings. Those combinations together of a coated with an uncoated or a tinted. And glass has just got really complicated. And that's before you throw in things like bird friendly glazing or power generating glazing or heated glazing or um, frit. I mean, there's all these different combinations you can get. So glass itself has just got very complicated. So we try to simplify that down and say, let's start at the beginning. So that's kind of where we're at. When, I, when we're in one of our factories or when I look at a piece of historic glass in an older building, there's really a couple things that I look at that kind of key me into how that glass was manufactured. I can't necessarily like carbon date it. That's how you go, this is, 1930 glass, but by some characteristics, I can probably tell you what process that glass was made with. So when I look at a piece of glass, this is what I use. The top right picture shows how we look at glass in one of our plants. So this is a high power spotlight, about 2 million candle watt power. It's in a dark room and we shine that on a piece of white paper and we put the glass in between there. And what you're looking at is the transmission characteristics of that glass onto the paper. And the things that I'm looking for when I look at that glass is I look at the surface. So what does that surface look like? Is it bubbled? Does it have an orange peel texture? Is it rough? Is it smooth? That gives me an indication of was the glass in contact with something when it was being made. I look for the shape. So what you're seeing here is these kind of light patterns and dark patterns. 
and that shape typically indicates a thickness variation across the surface of the glass. And that is primarily made in the way that it's manufactured. So um, there's a little bit of variability in the thickness. People say, oh, they like how my old windows sort of throw the light. Most times that's what you're talking about is the thickness variations in the glass distort the, 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 the visibility ever so slightly. And the last thing that I look for is these vertical draw lines. So these are dark and light lines. I mean, if you flip the glass, they'll be horizontal, but these, these straight lines indicate essentially a later stage process that there's a lot of more mechanical stretching in. So with those three things together, I can typically tell what sort of process the glass was made with. So going back to in glass manufacturing, you know, glass has been around, uh, the earliest evidence of this was, was back in Pompeii in, uh, in uh, 49, uh, 43 uh, BC, I think. I mean, it dates way, way back to when you actually started having windows in buildings. But practically speaking, reasonable size windows were made with this process called crown glass. Um, and our company, uh, Pilkington, is in the UK. I think originally it was called the St. Helens a crown glass company. So this dates back to kind of 13th century. Our company is more like 17th, 18th century. But essentially what you would do is take a big ball of glass and you blow it into a little bit of an orb. You open up the orb and then you spin it into a large disc. And what you then do is you cut rectangles out of this large area on the outside. The center glass was kind of scrap glass. Sometimes that got used in lower class um, houses just to let light in and you didn't want as pretty of a view. Uh, but it's it's an, a really nice glass. Um, it, you know, you obviously can't make a lot of windows and can't make very large windows with this. But if you look at the glass quality, it's really nice. It throws the glass well because there's a lot of thickness variation. The surface is pretty clean. There's not a lot of draw lines from distortion. But you just can't make very big windows with it. So a uh, crown glass was a, has been around for a long time. And cylinder glass came in around the 1700s sometime. I don't have a great date on this, but it, it wasn't a big derivation. Essentially, all you do is instead of taking that ball and, and starting to open it up, you would blow that into a large cylinder and you would keep adding glass to blow this into a large cylinder. There's a couple of companies that still do this. A Lambert's um, is one. Um, and there's a couple others that I, I can't come to the name of right now. But essentially what you do is you blow these long cylinders and then you cut the ends of the cylinders off and you split the cylinder lengthwise and heat it back up. And what you then do is as that heats back up, you unfold that into a big rectangle. Uh, and this is, you know, it's still what's called um, a Lambert's heavy restoration uh, and light restoration product. It's a really nice hand-blown sort of product. This, this really evolved into a much more industrialized process. And you can see here, one of those ways was this vertical drawn cylinder. You're literally pumping air into this as you draw it vertically out of a furnace. And then they also had these others where you injected it into this big kind of steel tube. And there was almost like a bicycle pump that pulled a vacuum. But this made pretty big windows. I mean, some of these things were 10 feet long, three foot diameter. That made a really, really large um, um, cylinder and it really made a really large rectangle. And it was a pretty industrialized process, but it was still fundamentally a batch process. And the thickness variations um, made a really pretty glass, but it wasn't very strong because it was so, so optically changed. So plate glass comes along and this is again, early 1800s, maybe 1830s in Europe, 1870s in the US. Um, and what you would did with this is instead of trying to blow this glass, you're mechanically forming it. And that's where most of the, the changes in glass manufacturing have occurred, is actually in the forming process. So with this, imagine an old um, washing machine where you have two like squeegee rolls that would squeegee out the water. You take this molten glass, you pour it in between these two squeegee rolls, and then it would go right onto a water-cooled steel plate. This bottom middle picture here shows kind of an earlier version of this where they would literally just roll a roll across the water cold steel. So this is pretty cool because it gives you this really nice thick glass. Most times there's some sort of distortion on the bottom or a mark where the, the steel plate actually has like this diamond pattern in the bottom to hold the glass in place. So it typically had to be polished. But this now gets you to a technology that really enabled all sorts of other things. The plate glass is now thick enough that you can polish it down and even after you polish it, it still leaves a glass that's at least a quarter inch thick. The reason that's important is because now you have these really big sheets of glass that are actually strong enough they can start withstanding things like high wind loads and things like that. So a lot of people aren't aware of this, but skyscraper technology really wasn't able to be possible until you had three things. Air conditioning, you had to have elevators, and you had to have plate glass that could actually withstand these, these wind loads at higher elevations, or you just had really small windows, these really small punched windows. Um, but plate glass ultimately was a batch process. 
It took lots and lots of changes to actually polish it down. Polishing initially took about eight hours to do one piece of glass, four hours on one side, four hours on the other. You would take it from a half inch thick to a quarter inch thick. Um, and it was really expensive. So, I mean, you can imagine how costly that is. Um, but it was a really nice product and, and started to get used widely in commercial. Rolled glass was a very slight derivation from this, whereas instead of going right onto a, a plate of steel, it would go directly onto a roller bed. And since you're still polishing it, it really didn't matter if it had a little more surface distortion that was imparted from some of those rolls. But this is the first time, and I don't have a great date on this, but this is the first time you go from a batch process to a, a continuous process. You still at this point had to polish in stages and batches, but you're now starting to churn out that glass, which helps bring your cost down quite a bit. And then sheet glass. This is the what I've got pictures of here is the Colburn sheet glass process. So this is more really an in innovation in terms of residential glass. So what you're looking at here on the bottom left is this is a vertically drawn furnace. This metal bar would get dipped into the glass. It would get drawn vertically about three or four feet until it would hit the top of this large roller. And then it would turn and go horizontal all across a roller bed. And this top picture here shows this vertical ribbon that takes place. So why is this such an innovation? This is now a continuous process that doesn't need to be polished afterwards because it can cool a couple hundred degrees. The glass doesn't get all that um, surface uh, imparted onto the onto the glass, so it doesn't need to be polished. Now, it's not strong enough to withstand those wind loads on big commercial buildings, but for houses, um, this was a revolutionary product. I mean, so after this was in 1917, Charleston, West Virginia, pretty much in the 1920s on, any house in the U.S. was pretty much going to get built with a sort of glass process. I mean, it was that revolutionary because your output of glass went up by like 10x, your cost come down by like 5x. So, I mean, it was really revolutionary. Um, but this is a really neat process. And this eventually got displaced and really all residential and commercial glass today gets produced with what's called the float glass process. Um, this was innovated in the 1950s. So you have a big molten furnace, it pours onto a bed of liquid tin, and that's what this bottom left picture here shows. The tin is actually less dense. So like oil and water, the, the glass floats on top of the tin. It makes it nice and optically flat, nice and clear. You cool it down from about 2,000 degrees down to about 1,000 degrees before you put it on a roller bed. So that those rollers really don't put any sort of marks into the glass. Um, and now at this point, you can take it out, put it directly into the window. No processing, even for large commercial tall buildings. So really revolutionary. Um, the thing I do want to mention on this, though, is if you look at that original slide, I talked about glass complexity. Um, you know, we were still selling plate glass up until the 1980s in North America. And float glass, the first float plants went in in North America in the 1950s. So, I mean, it took almost 30 years to build enough capacity to displace that technology to where float was what was commonly used. So when people try to use dates of manufacturing, they say, oh, well, this must be the date the building changed. You know, sometimes it takes a long time for these things to kind of take away. So keep that in mind when you're trying to look at construction dates versus available material dates and really try to figure out what's in a building. So that talks a little bit about glass. When I talk about windows, there's other things that go into windows today. Glass coatings, most people think this is, you know, brand new technology. This has been around the last few years. Really the first patents on coated glass date back to World War II. Um, and this innovation came from a guy named Harold Master who also worked for Libby Owens Ford. But uh, our company, like most companies at that time, um, helped support the war effort. And we made a lot of tra uh, transparencies for planes. We made carrier planes and fighter jets and all sorts of things. And one of the problems they had is the windshields in these fighter planes would actually frost up um, from high elevation and speed, and uh, the pilots couldn't see out, which is not great. So you have this idea to say, well, let's take chlorine doped tin oxide, put it on the inside surface that lowers the emissivity enough to where the glass won't frost up. So you've heard of low E, low emissivity glass actually started in World War II in the 1940s, um, but really it didn't take off into commercial or residential buildings until much later. So this didn't take off until the U.S. oil embargo. 1970s, 1980s, the U.S. government starts saying, look, our dependency on, on oil is massive. We have to do something to reduce our energy footprint. So um, being good engineers, we say, OK, let's do a Pareto chart. Where's our number one usage of, uh, of energy? It's in building operations. When I break that down, where are the biggest uses there? Commercial and residential, it's heating, lighting and air conditioning. So if we just put in loads of regulations around windows and insulation and all those sort of things, that will reduce our oil de or, or dependency on imported oil. And as such, pretty much anything after the 1980s, if you're gonna make a window, new windows pretty much are gonna be double glazed. So two pieces of glass with an airspace, most of those had a low E coating in. Um, so really, you know, 
later later technology before it really started getting wide scale adoption. There's really two ways these coatings are made. One's called pyrolytic coating or hard coating. Um, and this is a gas that reacts on the surface of the glass while it's still in that tin bath, 1500 Fahrenheit. You put this gas in there, it reacts and leaves metal oxides on the surface. And you put a couple layers down and so you have a couple thin film coatings that are put down. Pyrolytic coating is really hard, it's durable, it can be tampered, it can be bent. Um, but you can't get the material selection, so you can't put the metal oxides on there that are the really best at filtering out the heat. Um, so what that coating is, is called sputtered coating. So sputtered coating are also, also sometimes called soft coating. Essentially here you make the glass and then you put it in a vacuum chamber, you shoot electrons at a metal target and it leaves metal oxides on the surface. So the, the coatings themselves are pretty similar. Sputter coats are soft coats. You can hand mark a little bit more. Um, they're a little bit not as durable. Um, if you put a fingerprint on them before it's made, that fingerprint will probably show the life of the product. And they oxidize a little bit more quickly from air and moisture and things like that. So if you have them on the inside of an IGU, over time, those might corrode a little bit faster or a little bit worse than pyrolytic coating would. The benefit of that is sputter coating, you can select materials to, to target like silver and other things like that. And those just do a better job of filtering out the sun's energy or a better job of leaving in more visible daylight. So there's a good purpose for both. They're both still sold and pretty active today. So it really depends on what you're trying to do as to which one we would probably select. But again, when I think of coating history, you know, there's really two functions that we're trying to get out of coatings that we apply to glass. The first thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to get the glass and the coating to act like a filter. So essentially what we're doing is on the bottom left here, this is the solar spectrum. This is the sun's energy that comes in. And the sun's energy comes in as UV, this purple area, visible daylight. So this is this green area and near IR. So if you think about that as, as a building occupant, what do you want? I want to see all the daylight that comes in and I want to filter out all the heat that comes through that, that I don't want to, like in the summer. I want to not have my AC load be massive. So essentially that's what we're trying to do with coatings. And, and some coatings are, do a kind of a soft job of this and it's a, it's a really soft curve and others are very spectrally selective. And what that means is it's almost like a scalpel. You can go in there with a knife and cut out most of the UV, leave in the visible daylight and cut out most of the near IR. Um, but the thing you'll notice with this is about 40% of the energy comes in in the visible daylight. So that means that a 0.4 SHGC, and I'll talk about performance in just a minute, about a 0.4 SHGC is about as good as you're going to get if you want a really high daylight product. Um, but we do two things. We, we make the, the coating into a filter, so filtering out what you don't want. And if you want to go less than a 0.4, you've got to take out a little bit of the visible daylight. The other thing that we're doing is we're trying to make the window into a better insulator. And so this can be either from the sun's energy that's coming in or from the room energy that's going out. Like in the winter, we're trying to keep that heat in. Essentially, what you're trying to do is the sun's energy and room energy or long range IR heat, um, they travel in waves. And those waves either get transmitted through a piece of glass, they get reflected off the glass, or they absorb in the piece of glass. And then that absorbed heat can either continue transmitting through or it can reflect back in. And ultimately, what we're trying to do with these things to make it a better insulator is especially like in the case of that room heat, what you're trying to do is reduce your transmission and increase either your reflection or your absorption. And you have to do this in kind of all these different areas, UV visible and near IR. So it depends on what you're trying to do, but ultimately that's what we're trying to accomplish. Make the window into a better filter, make it into a better insulator. And the key on this is I tell people, you know, not all low E looks the same. So all of these buildings have low E glass. It's a double glazed window with low E. So they look dramatically different. So some higher performance low E's, like I mentioned, those uh, soft coats or the sputter coats, you know, when you put down three layers of silver and you're really trying to go to really low, really low solar load, Sometimes they get a little reflective. Sometimes they get a little colored and they're a little bit silver. Um, there's other coatings that are darker and they do that through absorption rather than through reflection. So you might have a fairly dark coating that's, that's fairly absorptive or colored, um, or you might have really color neutral ones that look almost the same as two pieces of clear glass. So really target what you're trying to accomplish in terms of performance, but understand your aesthetics. And then I'll talk about performance a little bit more as I go on. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of history and window design is what's called insulated glass. So this is very common today. Um, most windows today have two pieces of glass with an air, air space in between them. But that's not new technology. The first patents on this date back to 1865. This guy named Thomas Stetson said, if I have two pieces of glass and I put a rope on the outside, 
I don't know if this is the Stetson guy that invented the hat or not. I'm not positive. But if you just take that rope and then tar it in place, that little air pocket in between there is kind of like putting two jackets. on. So that little insulated pocket, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a better insulated window. So that, that you know, started really early. But really the first commercial products that were really available for windows is this product on the top right called Thermopane. And this started in, you know, as early as the 1930s, really didn't popularize until the 1950s, but it started off as really a glass welded edge. So this, as I hear, was almost like, you know, like a gunpowder fire explosion that burned all the way around the edge and it welded these glass edges together with a dry air in between. And eventually that got displaced by this product in the, in the bottom right. It's also called thermopane, but there it was glass welded to metal. So if you think about like an old incandescent light bulb where the glass bulb actually goes right into the metal screw, it's that welding process. It's the exact same for this. Um, and it's a that's a really good strong bond, by the way. Um, and that was pretty much used for any insulated glass um, back in the 1950s, 1960s. So if you had a craftsman house or brownstone or anything that had a picture window in it in your house, it was almost guaranteed it was going to be this product. And it's because monolithic plate glass is just too cold to have in your house. You can deal with it in an office building because, you know, you've got big heaters, you're getting income from the office. But in your house, you know, most people at that time really couldn't afford a couple hundred dollar gas bill, you know, in the winter. So you, to make the comfort level where you could sit within five feet in the windows and not kill your, your um, gas bill in the winter, you had to have an insulated product. Um, and this, I mean, it was a great product. It actually had a 20 year warranty back in the 1950s. And the failure rate on units was really, really low. Um, but again, the U.S. oil embargo comes in and says, OK, well, we've got to have wide scale adoption of this double glazed technology. So really, this Thermopane product laid way to what we know today as double glazed vinyl windows, essentially. Um, and the reason that those were, were uh, what took over is because they just were the lowest cost thing to put in. So, I mean, they were, I'm guessing, probably half the price of what the, the Thermopane was. And it's because what you're doing is this design is just simpler. It's, it's not as kind of complicated to make that edge seal. Now, initially when these rolled out, I mean, they had horrific failure rates. So most people have this history of early 80s, even early 90s of uh, double glazed vinyl windows that, you know, fail after a year. And I think the failure rate was like 12 percent after one year. Um, and then that got up to like 5 percent after one year. And now I think the failure rate is less than a percent over five. I mean, they're, they're really low. And I think Cardinal has a really good job on their website. Um, I think theirs is, is something like you know, one percent after ten years. Or so. I mean, it's really, really low. So the, the, the technology's got a lot better. But when it first came out, not a great story. Um, but if you think about what this is, two pieces of glass. There's a spacer here. Most times, this is stainless steel or aluminum, and all you're doing is keeping that space in between the two panes. There's a primary seal that's on the edge of this, and typically that's like a PIB, a polyisobutylene or something like that. It's an organic material that seals the glass to the. And then there's a secondary seal that's most times like a silicone or something like that. And you're trying to keep moisture out. This spacer a lot of times has a desiccant inside of it. And then in the air cavity, most times there's some sort of gas. So whether it's air or argon or krypton or something like that. Essentially, the way you think about that is the larger the molecule is, the less of them there are in there to do heat transfer. So really big molecules like krypton, there's not many things in there. Less heat transfer, it's a better insulator. Um, the challenge with this design and what most people complain about is over time, this PIB material is an organic material that breaks down um, with time, temperature, humidity, moisture, all these sort of things. So again, they've got a lot better, but ultimately what can happen is this organic material breaks down, the gas leaks out, water and moisture leak in, and then that moisture starts to attack those coatings and they start to fog up and gray. And so when you see a, a failed unit, if there's moisture in there, or if there's kind of an, an opaque sort of look to it, most times that means your seal has failed on these. Things. And that's by far the biggest criticism of this, this design. So that goes into the history. So that tells you a little bit about if you're dealing with an old building, what do you maybe have in place? The next thing I talked to you about is glass performance basics. So when I talk to architects or when I talk to homeowners, these are the sort of things that people care about and how does the window actually perform. And there's really three things that we talk about. I won't go into great de detail on this, but visible daylight, how much daylight comes in. So on a ratio between zero and one, one is 100% of the daylight comes in. Zero is it's a black wall. How much daylight comes in? SHGC is the same thing, but it's just for the sun's energy. How much of the sun's energy gets transmitted through? So sometimes those coatings and the glass itself you know, filter out parts of that and they still leave daylight in. 
and then U factor. U factor is a, how good of an insulator is this? And the inverse of U factor is R value. R value is typically what people talk about in terms of wall insulation. So my wall is an R10, my, my roof is a R20, same thing in windows, but we talk about it in the inverse, which is U, U factor. So those three things are typically what we talk about. The key that I wanna tell people is just because those three things, you have a set number, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that your performance and your aesthetics are going to be mutually exclusive. So you can sometimes get a, bu a building that looks exactly the way that you want and hit those targets. Um, but there are trade-offs. I mean, there's no magic glass that lets through all your daylight and then blocks all the sun's energy and is a perfect insulator. You know, the physics of this is there's just going to be trade-offs. But with that said, if I pick a number and say, okay, 0.6% visible daylight, 0.4% SHGC, and a 0.3 U factor. I can probably find you 10 or 20 different windows that will meet that number and they're gonna look dramatically different. So don't just know what your targets are, also know what the aesthetics are of the building you wanna, you wanna have. And there's codes that go around the country, really around the world that have different targets on these things. Um, primarily the biggest difference on these is that if you look in residential, residential tends to be dominated by your heating bill, especially in the Northern climates. So in those areas, a lot of times we won't have things where, where we're saying we they have a required uh, SHGC. Um, you're more going to have your targets on your U factor. So you want good insulated windows. Um, whereas commercial buildings, even in all climates, those tend to be dominated by your air conditioning loads. So most times what's more important on those buildings is the type of SHGC that you design, but especially so in the south. So the, the more sun, the hotter it is, that's where you really start to have dominant uh, SHGC. But again, the, the key on this is what are your mechanisms of heat transfer? So heat transfers through conduct, conduction, convection, and radiation. Um, and all we're trying to do with our window designs is figure out how to minimize heat transfer through our windows. And, and really, this is when I start to talk about vacuum insulated glazing, is that conduct, conduction convection component is about 70% of the heat transfer. So really, if we could get rid of the air, we would get rid of all the conduction and convection mechanism, which would make the window a much better performer. So I'll talk a little bit about some of these things in just a bit. When I, when I think about windows in general though, there's only a few things that we can do in terms of the center of glass. Window designs um, more holistically, there's a lot of things you can do with the spacers. You can have uh, thermal breaks in it. You can have non-thermally broken edge seals or, or less conductive materials, or you can put shading in there. You can use uh, different fritz. You can use a tree that's on the outside. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can do to figure out how to make the windows, you're gonna have an overhang. You can make your windows more highly performant with a lot of options. But in terms of center of glass, there's really only about four things that we can do to make the glass itself do a better job of reducing heat transfer. So one is we can use a darker, more absorbing glass that absorbs the heat rather than let it transmit through. We can use a better gas, so we can go from air to argon or krypton, or if you have no gas, there's a vacuum. So that will reduce heat transfer. We can use better coatings. So if you go from a single silver to a double silver to a triple silver, or if you use a, a low E on surface two and on surface four, you know, you're actually gonna have a better performing window if you have better coatings and more coatings, or you can use more than one piece of glass. So that's what drives you from going from a single glazing to double glazing to triple glazing. But really beyond those four things, there's not a lot in terms of center of glass that we can do to improve the performance of glass. And the reason that that's important is, energy codes are starting to get to the end of what we can achieve with typical double glaze technology. In North America, that's 98% of the market. And we're almost getting to that point where all the different tricks and tools that we have to make double glazed coating meet code, you're almost out of those sort of like tricks. So it gets to the point where, you know, new codes, we're going to have to come up with something new in order to achieve this. So we're looking at all the different technologies that are, that are available. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about vacuum insulated glazing. So again, VIG um, is not new technology. The first patents on this date back to 1917, or, uh, 1913, pardon me. Um, and the first commercial product on this actually wasn't available until 1997. So it took almost 100 years to figure out how to commercialize this product um, once, once we had the first ideas and the first patents. Um, and the first patents date back to what's called the Dewar Flask. So from when you were a kid, if you had in your lunchbox, you had a Superman uh, thermos, you know, that Superman thermos is the same technology with the Dewar flask. So it's a, two metal walls, and then there's a vacuum in between those two chambers. And that's because heat doesn't travel through a vacuum very well. Um, there's no air in there to do heat trans, transmission with convection conduction. 
a really good insulator. But it took almost 100 years because it's a really tricky technology to make in terms of windows. So why is this something that we should care about? Well, a typical IGU for most windows today that you're going to buy uh, is about one inch thick. And a VIG pane is the same or maybe a little better performance, especially in terms of insulation. It's better, but it, it's much thinner. So it's only a quarter inch thick. So the reasons that you might think about using VIG instead of this traditional one inch IGU is there's no gas in there. So, you know, you get rid of that convection and conduction component. It's a better insulator. It's thin, so it fits existing window sash. So if you have an older single glazed window and you want to just take out the glass and reglaze it with VIG, essentially you can get to the same or better performance than if you just replace the entire window. So there's a lot of reasons that people might want to do that. It's lightweight, so it's going to fit in operable windows if you're going to have an operable window. Um, and it avoids those issues with organic IGU seal failure. So I mentioned that PIB and that organic material breakdown. Most VIGs are sealed with an inorganic material, so you don't have that same corrosion uh, erosion mechanism on your edge seal. Sound doesn't travel through a vacuum either, so you get a nice STC or sound uh, uh, acoustic reduction, um, and it's fully reversible. So if you have older windows, you want to just change it out and put this in, you get to keep the windows. So there's a lot of reasons that, um, that you might want to think about this technology, um, but the reason that it took a, almost 100 years to actually commercialize is it's really tricky to make. And really, there's, there's three primary tricks on how you manufacture VIG and how that compares to an IG and why it's so difficult. So again, this is a schematic. This is a side view of two pieces of glass um, and an argon or air fill in a one inch IGU. So on the bottom, in contrast, it's the same two pieces of glass. But the first thing you think is if I just pull a vacuum on that IG, the first thing that's going to happen is the panes are going to suck in and they're going to collapse and touch. So now as it's going to be super distorted, but you're not going to have an insulator because those panes are going to touch. So the first thing you have to do is you have to have this spacer array. So literally every inch across the entire face of the glass, you have to have a little pillar to keep those glass panes from collapsing. The second thing you have to do is, is once you've got that done, the edge seal, that organic material is going to suck in as well. So you have to have a way to seal the edges. And most times this is done with a low temperature molten glass. So this might be something that melts at maybe half the degrees of like a regular soda lime glass, and it can also be a metal to glass weld. So similarly to what I talked about in the thermopane product, you actually can weld the glass shut with a metal uh, on the glass seal on the side. So you have to have, you know, a pillow array to keep them from collapsing. You have to be able to seal the edges, and then you have to be able to get the air out. So most times this is done by drilling a hole in through the glass. You vacuum out the air, and then you seal that with that same inorganic material. There are a couple of VIG designs that don't have this pump out tube, um, but most of those are, are still kind of emerging. Um, they're not, that's not what's commercially available in practice. And um, they're also sometimes, I think that the manufacturing of those is a little bit more challenging and maybe a little bit more costly than some of these other methods. But it's really at the same, it, it, as long as it gets the air out effectively, there's a couple different ways that you can do that. So what you're left with is, you know, a traditional IGU, again, is about one inch thick, and a VIG is about a quarter inch thick. And you can get to up to about an R8, so about a, a U factor of 0 0.12. Um, really, really good insulator and a really thin profile. So the challenges people say is, well, how does that impact the aesthetics? What's it going to look like? You know, am I going to be able to see all that stuff? And I've, I've really got this zoomed in to be able to show you. So on the left here is a zoomed in picture of this VIG. And, and here I can show you these lines of this little spacer array. And, and this is for effect, effect just so you can see it. And on the right, this is, I took this picture from about two feet away from an installed project. So arm's length, even if I know they're there, the spacer array, you pretty much can't see. I mean, they're 0.2 millimeters round. So that's 128 of an inch. Um, and they're, they're, most of them are dark. There are some different patents out there for glass pillars um, and other ones. And and you just have to evaluate the aesthetics on whatever product you have. I, I've seen some of the glass pillars and some of the other lighter materials. You get like almost a refractive index. So you get like a starlight appearance off of some of those. It really depends and it depends on the lighting conditions. But most of these I look at, I think the spacer array is pretty much invisible. The bigger thing by far that we talk about is that protection cap. So if there is a protection cap in the design, um, it's going to be typically near the corner and you're gonna see it. I mean, it's gonna be in every single light. So if you have a true divided light, you have a nine over nine panel, um, there's gonna be a lot of little buttons in there. So maybe for the aesthetics, you don't want that, 
Um, but even in practice, this is not really something that's easy to see. Um, glass and window people, we always look at the glass. Most people actually look through it. And the next few pictures, I'm going to show you some of those, those, those pictures. But that is definitely a visible portion of the design. So this is a project that we did at um, MIT. There was a three-year study that MIT did, and they looked at, they have these really large double hung uh, steel true divided light windows. They're about 100 years old in the historic campus. So if you're at the, the main dome and you're looking at it from the river, it's the two legs that, that face you. And it's the leg on the right-hand side has all been reglazed with this product. But they took three years to say, what are the alternatives? So let's reglaze with um, storm windows. Let's reglaze with um, replacement glass. Let's reglaze with full replacement and IGUs. Um, and they went through a couple of different things. And they ended up making replica sash that was the exact same steel dimensions as what they had, and they reglazed it with VIG. The key on this, though, is when you look at this project from the outside, you can't see anything. You don't see the spacers. You don't see the caps. You don't see anything. Um, and that's really important most times um, from a historic approval board is they don't want the, the building to look different from the outside. And, and my experience has been you don't see anything different from the outside on any of these sort of buildings. This was kind of a worst case picture that I tried to put in here because in the right conditions in a bright white or light sky, you have these dark caps. You can definitely see those. The, the challenge is your eye is kind of trained to look past the color black. So the same way when you look out the window, if I didn't point that out, your eye wouldn't be complaining about all these mutton bars and all these mulligans and the, the spacers that are here. Um, but your eye generally looks to the color black. And the same thing is, is the case with this. So in a historic building, most times we spec black as the protection cap color. Most times your eye just looks through these and most people, 99% of the people that walk into the classroom are never going to see it. Really, it also depends on the, the lighting conditions and the other things that you're looking at. So this is just slightly different conditions, same project, you get a little bit off angle. From the outside in reflection, you don't see anything. From the inside, you know, most of these you can't see. I can pick out a couple here and say, okay, there's one there. Um, but but really, it, it ultimately depends a lot on the lighting condition you're at. Here's another installation that we did in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Again, this is probably about 10 feet away from the inside. You can't see anything here. You get a little bit slightly different view, and you can start to see some of these caps again as you get pretty close. But to me, this is one of the key stories on, on why it's really interesting. This is the Milwaukee War Memorial, a Saarinen building. Um, all of this has been reglazed with a VIG, except for this one panel. And I don't remember, I think we had a, a ladder that went through it and broke it or got chipped an installation or something like that. But this is quarter inch monolithic glazed and all the rest of this is VIG. And this is on a cold winter day in Milwaukee. This project is right on Lake Michigan. So it's about 20 degrees outside. The glass temperature here again is 30, 35 degrees. The glass temperature here is probably closer to 60 degrees. And the key thing is, it, it really minimizes all your condensation. So now you're not getting all this condensation. And by the way, that condensation is actually what leads to all the water runoff and then all the steel corrosion or all the rust or all the rot on all your wood. So all the other impacts of not just can you see through it, not just is it more comfortable, but it actually causes less structural issues for you over time as well. So if you have historic windows and you really want to keep those and keep them in better shape, it's a nice solution for you. And this is a, a project that we did in New York. Same thing as we've got this glazed, um, the original monolithic quarter inch plate glass is on one side, the VIG is on the right side. And you can see on a cold New York day, it's about 30 degrees outside. Let me see if the video is gonna play here. But on the left-hand side, glass is all fogged up, it's all iced. Um, and some of the studies that we've seen on this say that, you know, anywhere within about five feet of this, this window. You can't sit. It's just too comfortable and it's too cold when you get anywhere close to it and you can't see out your windows. So if you pay for a nice Park Avenue um, a condo, you can't, see the, the, you can't see the park. But in contrast, you have the, on the right, the VIG and the VIG, when you actually do a nice comparison of this, again, the glass temperature on the inside is about 35 degrees here on the left. And on the right hand side, it's closer to 58, 60 degrees. And this is what the lowest performance VIG uh, product that's available on the market. So there are even higher performance ones that even get that glass up a little bit warmer on the inside. So I'm gonna go through a couple case studies now. Just talk about some of the ways that this uh, the VIG has actually been used in historic restoration. The very first one is a project called the Odd Fellows Lodge. This is up in Syracuse, New York. Um, this 
was on the National Register of Historic Places, wood sash. The wood had some rot and they ended up uh, fixing it back up. The, the key on this was it was single hung wood, really narrow sash, not a ton of bite on this. And the key that we say is, is when we're trying to do a glaze on this, we try to make sure there's about an eighth inch of space between the, the edge of the wood and where the glass starts. And it's really nice if we can get about a 916, so if you have about a half inch bite. Some of the steel sash that we get into, um, it's not quite as large. The mutton bars are really slim on those. Um, but what you want to try and do is get this embedded back a little bit to where you actually have all this covered up um, and you get a nice performance and you don't see any sort of a vision area on this. Um, but that was a really nice project that was actually done for veterans housing for low income. The next one I already mentioned is the Milwaukee County War Memorial. Um, this one uh, was redone in 2017 as an aero serenade design building. And the architect was actually hired to do a curtain wall replacement on this um, because it was quarter inch wire glass. It was horribly energy efficient. Wire glass, as you know, cracks, lots of leaks coming through. And this is the main staircase that goes through the four stories of the War Memorial. Um, and so when they started looking at their options, you know, replacement was what they was what they were hired to do but they said let's look and see if we can do a restoration so it doesn't change serenin's design and when they went and evaluated the glazing detail i mean this is stick built steel it's about four inches deep so they had plenty of depth that they actually could have accommodated a one inch igu here a one inch igu would have worked fine and it wouldn't have substantively changed the the, the vision area where you would have really seen those igu edge seals you could have put dark ones in uh, but it wouldn't have really changed the way the building looked. The challenge with doing that and retrofitting it is you would have had to retap about 13,000 glazing bars, which means a tremendous amount of holes, means filling all the old holes, and it probably meant about two more months of having the scaffolding on site, and the labor costs on the project just went through the roof. Um, when they evaluated just monolithic glazing, even with a low E, like a hard coat low E, it just didn't give them the energy performance that they wanted. They would have got a little bit of a boost, but they were really trying to make the space much more comfortable. So by reglazing with a VIG, they could use the same glazing bars, use the same glazing holes, put everything back in its place, actually keep everything about the center and design the same, and get the energy efficiency to the targets that they were originally trying to achieve. So, um, and in the end, it ended up being the lowest overall cost project by reglazing with a VIG um, compared to a for full curtain wall replacement or doing the re, re restoration done with a one inch IGU and having to retrofit. It was a really nice project. A couple other ones, I've mentioned the MIT project already. Um, Winston-Salem, I took, showed you a couple pictures. This one was a steel casement window. And what they were gonna do is go in and just reglaze all of the original steel windows and then add an interior storm window to get the energy efficiency up. Um, what they didn't like about that was storm windows sometimes change the sight lines. You know, it takes up a couple inches of depth. You lose all of that exposed hardware and they had some really nice bronze hardware um, you have to take the storms off to do cleaning. Energy efficiency, it did an okay job on getting the energy efficiency up. So by reglazing this one with the original uh, uh, sash with VIG, they didn't have to install any plate glass. They didn't have to install storms, change the aesthetics, have to have something they had to remove to do maintenance on it. And the energy efficiency was actually better than what they originally targeted. Um, and the overall cost, they didn't have to put the storms in. The overall cost ended up coming down a little bit as well. Professional Children's School in New York City. This is about an eight story tall building. Um, casement windows, steel casement windows, just reglazed with the IG. On this one, the, one of the reasons I mentioned it is um, they reglazed it to try and get better energy efficiency and, and make the, uh, the building perform a little bit better, just upgrade the facade in terms of performance. But the biggest thing that the teachers said was when a truck used to go down the street, they have to stop class because the noise was so bad with monolithic glazing. And with the VIG, I think the, the, the VIG has an STC rating of about a 34 or better. Um, so they actually said that it, the, the sound improvement above everything else was what they were most impressed, impressed with. So it is a, a nice another benefit that comes along with the VIG. This is another one of the John Sevier building in Nashville. Again, existing windows, steel casement windows. What you're looking at here on the bottom right, these are the original casement windows. The VIG fits into the existing sash and even the thinnest I, thin line IGU doesn't. It just doesn't physically fit in there. So that's really one of the key benefits is when you're doing restoration, especially is it just gives you the footprint to actually do what you would normally do with monolithic glass, but it allows you to get that performance of kind of a replacement product. 
and I, I mentioned the Milwaukee County War Memorial Project already. Um, most of those ones I mentioned in North America are within the last five to six years. In Europe, we've been rolling out the VIG product for probably 20 years. Um, there, a lot of historic buildings, a lot of ones where lower occupant bills are really important or keeping the existing window design was really important. And in Japan for almost 25 years now, we've gone into both new construction and into restoration projects, but quite a few different projects for, for global references. One of the other things I wanna mention is just the case for retrofitting in general. So we're seeing this drive, not just as historic retrofits, but just in dealing with older buildings in general, there seems to be this kind of new and invigorated push to say, what technologies are available to help us do this better? Um, one of the things that stands out to me when I look at things like Architecture 2030 or New York City 2050, you know, Local Law 97 says that by the year 2030, um, buildings that are above, I think, 25,000 square foot have to have a 40% reduction in their energy usage. And 90% of the buildings that are going to be around in 2050 are already built today. And by 2050, they have to redu have an 80% reduction. So we're seeing this in... You know, New York City, we're seeing it in the Pacific Northwest, we're seeing it up in Canada, Washington State just enacted our law on this. Architecture 2030 is encouraging cities around the country and around the world to sort of enact these technologies. And, and the, the things that are to me most interesting is, one, you're dealing with existing buildings. Most building code up to this point is only dealing with new structures. So the fact that you're starting to recognize that if you want to hit some of these targets, you have to deal with existing buildings is, is key. The New York City 2050, the reason that's so important is in New York City is the largest city in the country, and it's probably the most aggressive one at dealing with an existing building. The last reason I like this, and I think it's so interesting, is it's actually performance based. You know, even even uh, modern building energy codes are based off of targets and they don't actually measure how you perform. You know, there's a lot of lead platinum buildings that are some of the biggest energy hogs in the city. Um, and this one actually says, I don't care what you tried to put in. It's what your energy bill is. It's do you actually reduce your energy bills? That's the reason it's kind of cool. So I think this is just starting to take off and people are seeing we have to do more on existing buildings. So, you know, traditionally, if I look at what we do um, in an existing building, you want to keep the windows or you have to keep the windows because it's, it's a designated building. You know, sometimes we'll put uh, secondary glazing in. So either internal or external storms. Those do a nice job. I mean, and there's definitely a place for this technology um, and it, it works really well. Um, and it's it's proven. I mean, so so I'm not dissuading anybody from secondary glazing. We still work with a lot of secondary glazing companies. And it's nice solutions. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't improve the rep the performance. Typically, up to replacement performance. So especially if you're trying to get compliant with some of those energy reductions, you're only going to get a little ways. Um, it, it maintains much of the aesthetic. Um, some of the biggest uh, things with secondary glazing, it actually protects the original glazing. And that's a lot of the things that you don't get with some of the other retrofit solutions. Um, the one trade off that comes a lot of times with secondary glazing is you have to remove it to get some of that cleaning done. And it does sometimes change your aesthetics and your use and appearance to get modified a little bit. The other thing we typically do is we replace the windows. So we have old windows, we rip them out, we landfill them, and we put in new replacement windows. Um, and that will get you up to replacement window performance because you have new replacement windows. Um, the, the negatives on that is sometimes you're going from monolithic glazing to double glaze. And sometimes you go from, a, say, a three and a half inch sash depth to four, five, six inches sash depth. And that extra depth takes up space. It adds weight. Sometimes you have to retrofit the building to handle that extra weight on the skin. So there's just a lot of other things that, that kind of go into that. And if you look at this bottom right, all the glass that gets used in the entire North America, 98% of that goes into double glazed windows. And most of that has one type of low E that goes into it. So, you know, replacement windows are good, but there are certain trade-offs that you get with that as well. And that's typically the two tracks that we see what people do. So we're seeing now with this push to dealing with existing buildings, what are my other alternatives? So one is you can reglaze with VIG. So just take your existing sash, reglaze it with VIG. I've talked at length about that. You can also use the VIG as your secondary glazing. So if you think about that, now you're adding a double glaze product essentially to your original monolithic window. So now you get to triple glaze performance with a retrofit solution. So you're you're almost you're not almost, you are exceeding replacement window performance with a secondary treatment. So that's pretty exciting to me. And we're starting to see that take off. There's now some incentives up. I think me up in the Pacific Northwest just started to in implement some incentives on this. Um, so that's pretty exciting when we see that sort of stuff. The other thing we're seeing people do is they don't address the performance side, but they're addressing the weight side. 
So I mentioned sometimes when you add storms, you add all this weight to the skin. So there's companies that are taking one mil glass and they put a film on it and they now, now add that as your storm window. So it's the same performance as a secondary glazing, but it's without having to add all that weight into the design. And you can see, you can get to some pretty nice performance levels with some of these different technologies. The other thing that we're seeing people do is this can be in new construction and it can also be in dealing with existing buildings. But you think about an old failing 1970s curtain wall, but it's actually in pretty good shape except for the glazing. Are there strategies that you can go in and just reglaze that? And, and that's starting to be a discussion that we're having with a few people. Um, one of the ways that you can do that is with what's called a hybrid VIG IGU. So essentially you go to a double glazed IGU and the inboard light, you just make a VIG pane. So now you have, again, a triple glaze performance in a double glaze form factor. So that's a nice commercially available. You just reglaze your existing um, sash with this product. Or there's this new product that we're seeing people start to develop and, and design. And this is called a thin triple. So the thin triple I, IGU, the concept behind this is most times Europe, Europe has been, say, triple glazed for the last 20 years. It's been standard. But in the U.S., a one-inch IGU is pretty standard for commercial buildings. And when you go to triple glaze, that typically is an inch and a quarter, inch and a half. And it's much thicker, it's much heavier, and it requires basically changing everything about the window. It's new extrusions, it's beefier windows. You have to go from instead of casement windows to tilt and turns. I mean, it just dramatically changes everything about your window design. So the, the thin triple IG is, what if you just took your existing double glaze or your a new, win, new double glaze window, you drop a piece of one mil inside of that, and then you add Krypton on both sides. Well, Krypton is a really good insulator, even at thinner levels. So what that leaves you with is, again, a triple glaze performance that fits in a double glaze form factor. So we've, we're working with a couple of companies that are de designing these products now. And if you're a window manufacturer, you don't have to buy new extrusions. You don't have to change your designs. It's the same weight. It's the same, you know, pretty much everything. It's just a change out of the glazing component and you keep all the rest of your windows the same. So we're starting to see this as this kind of an emerging technology that's dealing with existing windows. Um, and also it, it's pushing some of the boundaries for new window construction as well, because it allows you to hit some of these stretch performance goals. Um, and then the last thing is thin laminates. We're, again, same thing. You're not dealing with the performance side, you're dealing with the, the form factor side. By using thin glass as your laminate, you can sometimes achieve much, much lighter weight solutions kind of previously thought were available with similar performance. And again, these, you're getting to really nice performance levels. And if you can uh, upgrade an existing failing curtain wall system to a really high performance triple glaze product, um, the energy savings is pretty massive. Um, the, the project costs are a little bit less. I mean, there's a lot of other nice benefits that, that kind of come along with this as well. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and end. And again, I'll stick around for a couple minutes. We can do some Q&A afterwards. I'll leave my email ad address after this, uh, but email me, call me, uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, I get involved in a lot of these sort of different technologies. But the key things is there's, you know, there's no one size fit all. There's none of these things that I talked to today that I'm saying we, this should be your wide scale adoption solution. But on every project that you look at, there might be slightly different uh, characteristics. There might be certain things that are important. And if you have a bigger toolbox, you just have more things to think about, some of these solutions might be a really nice fit for really certain projects that you're working on. So with that, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm always happy to help. Please feel free to call me or ask me any questions. I'm happy to help anytime. Thanks much and take care.